All right, so I'm back again. Uh, I have a few more things to talk to you about. The first one is that we've been focusing really, really heavily on, uh, on genetics. And of course, this chapter really is all about genetics. But please, please understand that in the environment can affect the phenotype as much as uh, genetics can. So genes, we say genes interact with the environment to produce physical characteristics or phenotypes. Um, and one of the most interesting ones, I think, is, um, is phenylketonuria, or it's also some, uh, shortened to PKU, phenylketonuria. Um, people with phenylketonuria have a problem, and that is that they are unable, they don't make an enzyme, or they make a malfunctioning enzyme, to make that turn phenylalanine into tyrosine. Now, phenylalanine and tyrosine are both types of amino acids. And this is interesting because you need all 20 of your amino acids in order to live a functioning life. If you can't convert phenylalanine into tyrosine, uh, you build up phenylalanine in your body, and this can actually lead to, a, uh, we, we say it leads to a birth defect, so like this that leads to a birth effect, um, that if you carry both of the mutant copies, then what happens is little by little, the phenylalanine builds up in your body, and basically within a few short months after being born, the, the phenylalanine reaches toxic level, it basically poisons the brain, leading to mental retardation and really other serious health problems. So that's what we call phenylketonuria. So, um, so notice here that you, you see on this can of diet soda a, a warning. It says phenylketonurus contains phenylalanine. Um, that's because if you have PKU and you avoid phenylalanine, if you avoid eating anything with phenylalanine, then you will actually never develop PKU, the disease, phenylketonuria. Um, it's a very hard thing to do. I mean, it's not just simply avoiding diet drinks, although you definitely have to avoid diet drinks. It's also avoiding meat, because meat contains phenylalanine and amino acid. So if you have, if you're diagnosed as an infant with PKU, you, you um, automatically become a true vegan. You cannot eat anything that has meat or cheese or dairy of any kind. Um, because you, you need to avoid taking in phenylalanine. If you take in phenylalanine, as an adult even, you will slowly start to close your brain and you will slowly start to have the same symptoms that you might have had as a child. There are other examples of how, very clear examples of how the uh, environment interacts with genetics. And um, one of them is is a uh, Siamese cats. If you ever notice that Siamese cats, and also like the Himalayan rabbits, which are way less common than Siamese cats, but they're at least around here. I don't know a lot of people who raise rabbits, but some people do. Uh, the, there's a gene that produces this dark melanin pigmentation you see around their noses. And the genes interact with the environment because those genes are heat sensitive. The dark pigment is produced only when it's cold out, in cold areas of the body. So you get the dark pigment in the ears and around the nose and mouth because those areas are colder than the rest of the body. The warm areas remain very light. So we only see the tip of the tail or the paws becoming dark, while the fur on the rest of the body is like a cream color or white, depending on if you're talking about the rabbits or the cats. So if you have a Siamese cat that lives in a cold climate, or maybe it spends a lot of time outside in the winter, mm -hmm. those uh, will have be much darker in color. And the one, and that's compared to a Siamese cat that kind of hangs out inside all winter long, mm -hmm. they're just gonna stay lighter in color. So you have the environment interacting and influencing the way that an organism looks. The same kind of thing can happen with uh, body weight, uh, 
it, you know, it's in relationship to caloric intake, how many calories you're eating. Or it can have to do um, with much more subtle things like personality. You might uh, have some genetic predisposition to some personality, but you were exposed to a trauma, and you have a different version of your personality being expressed. So DNA is not, is not really like a blueprint for a house because there's interactions between genotype and the environment. And if that weren't true, then you wouldn't have all um, things like having, you know, changes in weight or physical fitness, or maybe even the idea that if you invest in better schooling, then you can have kids that are smarter. Why would you ever invest in good schooling if, if environment didn't make any better difference in intelligence? Um, why would you ever have self-help or anything along those lines, or, or a society wanting to improve the lives of its citizens because you know you'd be just genetically predisposed to something. You're not genetically predisposed for things because, of course, you have some of that influence there, but you also have environment. Um, so the last big topic that we are well, we're going to cover a couple, two more big topics. We'll call it um, the last two big topics are that that. Um, Sometimes traits, they are passed on as independent features. So we call this Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment. Um, so Gregor Mendel didn't know about chromosomes. Um, what he did think was that each trait you had was like this free-floating entity in your cell. And, and, you know, he was sort of right as long as you were only looking at one trait. But if you start looking at more than one trait, remember earlier in this chapter, we, we were looking at cats and whether they had long hair or short hair, but we also looked at whether or not they had pigment or not, right? There's two separate traits, and each one has a dominant gene allele, and each one has a recessive allele. But what if you were trying to breed for long-haired white cats, and you, um, and you, you were, Looking at, um, you know, if you only if you thought that those were genes that weren't on chromosomes, right? If you didn't have any idea that they were on chromosomes, then you might approach that differently than if you understand that that they're actually um, on actually on chromosomes. And so, and remember, it's the chromosomes that that segregate. So Mendel's law of independent assortment says that when when alleles are segregating, um, they really don't influence each other. Now he was wrong about this a little bit, we'll talk about that in the next couple slides, but they basically, they don't really influence each other. And this is what we were talking about when we were uh, looking at, um, I'm sorry, when we were, when we were looking at uh, those chromosomes back in meiosis, and you were, had to put them on the metaphase plate, the equator, and, and we were trying to decide, oh, could it be in this arrangement or the other arrangement? We were really looking at the physical nature of how Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment works. So really, to, to summarize, and I'm just going to do this really quickly uh, because we'll spend more time on it in lecture. So if you have a short-haired cat, and short hair is, uh, in, in this case, where you see dominant, and we have a white furred uh, cat, in this case white fur is uh, also dominant, then we have two different genes, the L gene for the hair length and the W gene for the um, coat color. And so if you look at an individual that's heterozygous for both, hair length and white color, and you have another one that's got the same thing, short hair and white, then what you end up with is, you know, most of the offspring are short-haired and white. You have nine of those offspring being short-haired and white, but you have three of them that have color with short hair, and three of them that are white with short hair, and one of them that's colored with long hair. I said, I said short hair here, for, sorry, I meant long hair um, on these white cats. So, um, we we have this ratio of of uh, 
nine to three to three to one. Again, uh, this is a, a typo here, and I'm just gonna go over this with you in lecture, but, um, and we'll talk about how, how we can make sure that you've made the proper gametes and everything, and this is, this, this part of this lecture is in fact typoed, so I don't want to spend any more time on it. I apologize for the typos. And I'm just gonna move on from here. As I talk about um, what this process is called, it's called a dihybrid cross. Whenever you're looking at two separate traits coded for by two separate genes um, with four total alleles, we call that a dihybrid. And um, when neither of the two traits influences the inheritance of the other trait, we say that they, they assort independently, and that's Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment. Um, but here's the thing, here's what Mendel got wrong. Sometimes, well, not all genes follow this law of independent assortment. So just like, I guess, a law of speeding, you know, some people don't follow the law. And here we have Lindsay Lohan, who, I mean, I guess in many ways hasn't followed the law, but she's not following the law like many red-haired, freckled people don't. They don't follow the law of independent assortment. In fact, we say that red hair and freckles are linked together on their linked genes. And what they are linked is they're linked on the same chromosome. They're like right next to each other. So hair color and freckles are right next to each other on a chromosome. When crossing over happens, it's very rare that you would separate out the, the red hair from the freckles. And so red hair and freckles are often just passed on with each other, as are no freckles and non-red hair often passed along with each other. I know this is confusing, and we won't really do anything besides understand that if it, if an outcome does not appear to come up with the expected ratio, if a dihybrid cross doesn't come up with the expected ratio, then it's very likely that what you have is um, a linked set of genes. Well, that's all I have for you for this chapter, for chapter nine. And um, again, we'll spend a lot of time in class dealing with uh, these ideas. We actually spend um, two whole labs dealing with these ideas because they are very complicated. Okay, um, Will, I will see you in class and I hope you have a good one.